Good Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. I'm Eric Kane with Matt Ray, Rob Lewis, and Brent Hubbs. Hope everybody had a good 4th of July holiday, and I appreciate you guys still sending in those questions for the Mailbag Podcast. It's presented each and every Tuesday and Thursday by Exterior Home Solutions. For a free estimate, you can give them a call today. That's at 865-524-5888, or visit them online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. We'll go ahead and get into it. We'll start with some recruiting. Atheron's got a couple here. Matt Ray, the latest on William Satterwhite, a couple days out. Yeah, you know, this one, you know, one that continues to go back and forth. Um, you know, it continued to hear a little bit more Tennessee buzz uh, the last couple of days coming out of the weekend. Um, I think for William Satterwhite, it was about, you know, working through the process and, and, and trying to find one thing wrong with the school. He told me that a couple of different times. Like, if I could find one thing, you know, to separate one from the other, this would be over. Um, and he had, you know, was gone back and forth on this since the spring, so he felt like setting a, a commitment date would allow him to really focus on it and work toward it. Um, you know, he's going to do his best to keep people guessing, but I, I think there's some reason to be optimistic on the Tennessee side right now. But Clemson's not gave up hope yet either. Latest on Tyler, uh, Tylen Singleton and Kai Bates. Uh, let's start with Bates. You know, still uh, lean Tennessee there right now. Um, his family's going to be together uh, some here over the next week. And they're they're going to sit down and and work on some things. Still tend to think late July there. Um, you know, late July into early August before something's done one way or the other there. Uh, Tennessee's still hopeful to get Tylen Singleton into town at the end of the month. Um, as of right now, that's the plan. I haven't heard anything different there. That, that's going to be an important visit. As we've mentioned a couple of times, though, if, if he still sees LSU, you know, at some point during that open week, it certainly gives you, you know, some reason to hesitate on Tylen Singleton. Uh, so we'll we'll track that as well if, it's, if he does make it in. All right, then we'll finish off Atheron with this question. Does it seem like everything's still in line from what you've been saying about July being a good month, or um, are things kind of shifting in terms of the month of July for recruiting? Yeah, no, I think I think July still got the potential to be a really good month for Tennessee. You know, we'll see when some guys end up making a final decision and you know what comes of those. But you know, I think overall, again, we've said it for a while: win your fair share. And I think as guys, you know most likely decide in the month of July. I think you'll see, a, you know, several decide here. I think Tennessee's got a chance to do that. All right. This will be a good one for Brent and Rob here from Go Vols 182. Favorite player to watch all time. Doesn't specify that it has to be Tennessee, but I would imagine it's probably a Tennessee volunteer. Eric Berry jumps up to me, however, uh, real, real quick. We're talking about football. Yeah, I mean, for you know, recently, you know, if you're talking about recent guys, I mean, I, as a, you know, as a young kid, I, I, I certainly enjoyed watching Tony Robinson. Tony play. Robinson, number ten. Um, as you know, heading into graduating high school, heading into college, I mean, Heath Schuler was different than we had seen, um, in in any kind of deal. Uh, just a different type of player uh, at the quarterback position because he was so big and so physical. Um, I've said this, and will always say this. To me, Leonard Little is one of the one of the greatest to ever watch, that I've watched play come off the edge because um, Derek Barnett did this a little bit, but Leonard could just he, he could wreck a series. I mean, he could he could force a punt on his own uh, j- just by w- with what he did, and and he had a stretch there in his career where where he he was unbelievable. Uh, I've had the pleasure of covering a lot of guys. Um, and some of them are going to be in the Hall of Fame, <laughs> ultimately, you know, if they're not already there. And um, it, it's been a good run covering a whole lot of good, really good football players and, and some good basketball players as well. And, you know, Todd Helton was in baseball was as dominant of a player as we've seen. So um, I've been blessed to, to cover a whole lot of, of, of guys who, who would be considered potential favorite of all time. Yeah, I, 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 Hubbard covered some of these guys because he, he had a reporter's notebook in his, in his lunchbox. <laughs> I, I didn't, and I was, I, I was kind of watching him in, in, in high school and college. But man, Jamal Lewis, Hubbard. I, I mean, I, I know you, you were around and you were, you were in school when he was, and you, you were working and covering. Man, I'm, I, and I, I've told you this, Brent, and, and I, outside of Herschel Walker and Bo Jackson, I, I don't think there's been a better running back in the SEC than Jamal Lewis. Now, there, I mean, he's, you know, there's, 
I think he's in that tier with like Leonard Fournette, you know, Gurley. At, but I just, I mean, maybe I'm biased, you know, growing up in Tennessee and, and watching them. But I just, I don't think there are many. Again, Herschel and Bo, I, I think, are on, you know, a, a two person Mount Rushmore in the SEC. And I think Jamal's right below him. The interesting thing about Jamal, Tennessee had a lot of players who came in ready to play as freshmen and who played as freshmen. Uh, Leonard Little would have played as a freshman before he went, had, you know, had to go off to junior college because of his academics and uh, the, the red flag the NCAA put up. Eric Berry obviously played as a freshman. Nobody was more physically ready to play when they got off the bus than Jamal Lewis was. I mean, from the moment you saw him, you're like, okay, th- this guy's this guy's totally different. I've told this story before, I think. I mean, Rodney Garner. The greatest question mark Rodney Garner has ever had about me and my ability to cover football was when I openly asked him whether or not Jamal Lewis would end up being a fullback in college because he was so big coming out of high school. And um, he'll still laugh about that story to this day if you bring it up. And uh, all it took was about three days, you know, one day in pads um, down on the baseball field. Um to realize, yeah, that this guy can this guy can not only play tailback, he can play tailback right now. And he may have been the guy, he, he may be the guy closest coming out of high school that I've personally ever seen who you thought maybe could have gone straight to the NFL. Now, I don't think he I don't think he could have and been successful, but from a physical standpoint, he's the guy who looked closest to NFL ready coming out of high school of anybody I've covered. Hey Hubbard, you just said the baseball field, and that reminded me. Of one. And 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 this guy's not in that league, but I think he was a good player at Tennessee. But Monterio Hardesty, Hubbard, I, I don't think fans ever, without before the injuries. I mean, that kid was, and he was still a really good SEC running back. But I, I think without the injuries, I, I think that kid had had a chance to be really special. Yeah, you look at what he did his last year under Lane Kiffin. Um, you saw you saw glimpses of what he was doing before he tore his ACL as a freshman. That I mean, everybody at Tennessee, it was a consensus, everybody you talked to at Tennessee, that he was going to be the next great one. And um, he just had a hard time recovering from the torn ACL, which was really, really, really unfortunate because uh, I, I think not only would he have had a great college career, he would have had a he would have had a very productive NFL career as well. Super talented guy. Let's go to Big Oil. Uh, in the most recent era of NIL and Transfer Portal, has it drastically changed how people are recruited, developed, and playing time? Is this model suitable, or will it burst eventually, Brent? Well, I mean, we're seeing you know news every day about trying to put guardrails up and then the counter to the guardrails. you got the state of New York basically saying uh, in their latest law that the NCAA cannot look into any NIL deal that it's illegal in their state to, to, to even investigate, look into, or question any any NIL deal that a student athlete has. Um, they're having a hard time creating guardrails. Uh, now, I, I, think, I think the natural economy of things swings the money back. I, I don't think people are going to be spending just dumb amounts of money like we all thought or, or like some people thought that first year where everybody's like – you know, I mean, who, who was it? Ryan Day said, I got to have $20 million to manage my roster or, or some some number like that that was out there. That nobody's playing and nobody's going to be playing in that kind of annual dollar figure because there's just there's not the economy there to do it. Um, but in terms of management guardrails and, and legislation and rules and regulations, I mean, the NCAA versus the states. You know, in, in a legal court of law, seems to be brewing if the NCAA wants to go to court because the states the states are putting in their laws to basically tell the NCAA, stay out, you're not welcome in here. That's going to be the next fascinating step to me in NIL. I think the money again balances itself out over time, but but the but the regulations or is there ever any regulations is the next battle that's brewing out there. At least that's the way I view it. I, I may I'm, y'all may have a total different opinion, Rob and, and, and Matt. Uh, I don't have a different opinion on the money, Hubbard, but I, I mean, as far as like it changing, it, yes, it has drastically altered the way recruiting is done. And I, I think it's done it more in football or more in basketball than it has in football, just simply because of the numbers. I mean, you get two or three, you know, transfers in a year of basketball and just completely, you know, 
transform what your starting five or your, your eight man rotation looks like. And that's, that's a different animal than it is in football. Well, and, and I think from a recruiting standpoint, Matt, in the NIL world, you can, you can have good intel that school X is in a really good spot for them. And then school Y can come in with, with a, with a deal and it completely changes everything, which, 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 which makes it harder to predict because everybody's like, well, wait a minute, what happened last night or what happened the last 36 hours? Well, you know, that can happen, right, Matt? I mean, we're, we're you know, that that's out there and that's something from an NIL standpoint that has an effect on recruiting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's happening every day right now. And I mean, I think it, it varies um, by team, by position. Like you may be in a really good spot for a, you know, high four-star tight end, but you may have four really good tight ends on your roster, and yeah, you want to keep stacking that there. Your limit may be here, but, you know, like you said, Team Y, their limit may be here because they only have, you know, one returning scholarship tied in next fall. So, I mean, I think those variables are at play more so than people realize, and teams and schools get desperate. They have to land guys, um, especially later in recruiting cycles. Um, you know, I think that's one of the, the more interesting points. If you're not red hot on the field and, you know, there may be a little hot seat chatter, the best thing you can do to alleviate that is win some, you know, recruiting battles. So if you have the opportunity to do that and, you know, some NIL play behind you, you're going to go and you're going to make that happen. All right, let's go to NWGA Vol. What's the latest with Cam Franklin, and who are some other defensive tackle prospects on the board outside of Cam Franklin? Yeah, you know, I think with, with Cam Franklin, that one continues to be interesting. It, it's continued to feel like he's working towards a decision, but when does that come? I mean, at first it started, it was going to be December, and then it was going to be July. Now it doesn't appear that it's going to be July because he's still going to take some visits and how many of those are, you know, going to happen? I mean, it looks like he's going to get to Auburn. It looks like he's going to get to Miami. In a short five-day span to kind of end out June, he took four trips. So we'll see what he does again that last week of July. Is it decision mode then going into August? I don't think a lot has changed for Cam Franklin. I think he's filling out all of his contenders. I and mean, you know, he planned to take that Auburn visit in September and then decide after that, the last time that we saw him. But now um, he can get that out of the way earlier, so we'll see what happens there. Um, obviously, Tennessee will try to get him back to campus at the end of July if they can. Um, others are going to try to get him there. Ole Miss isn't going to go away. So, um, you know, Cam Franklin's recruitment is, you know, one you just buckle up and, you know, see where things go for a little bit. Uh, there's still a little ways to go there. There was what another was the question. Um who were some other other uh, targets there, defensive tackle? Yeah, so, you know, speaking about the end of July, Tennessee's going to do what they can to get Aiden Breeland out here at the end of the month. Uh, that one seems to be heading, you know, in the right direction in terms of him getting here. He was here back in May for 865 Live. Um, you know, there was some thought that he would commit coming out of June official visits. That didn't happen, so that leaves the door open for Tennessee. If you can get him across country again, and then try to get yourself in position for an official visit sometime in the fall, then you have a real shot there. Um, you know, outside of that, I think that defensive tackle position is one that Tennessee's got to continue to evaluate. There's some guys that they'll watch more in the fall. They'll at least want to see a couple of, you know, Friday night worth of stuff. And then, you know, we'll see where they go from there. But right now that's kind of where things stand as far as what I know at the defensive tackle position for Tennessee. There was one more question from Big Oil that I skipped over, um, so we'll show it again here. Six more years of the 2020s. How many more College World Series appearances would you think the baseballs uh, go during that time frame, assuming assuming Tony Vitello is still here? Man, that's one of those questions where you just don't know because, again, we've talked about it. It's, In my opinion, <clears throat> it's so difficult. It's one of the hardest things in all sports is to win the College World Series, and it's so difficult just to get there. I mean, you've got to – you got to have a roster built to, to win in the postseason, which I think Tony Vitello's done and he's shown. Um, you got to get hot at the right time, obviously. You got to have things go your way. And so, I mean, Tennessee's gone to two in the last three, but I mean, I, I have no idea how you can <laughs> try to answer that question in terms of how many more will they get in this decade. As long as Tony Vitello's here, I'll say this 
Um, he's shown that he builds the roster to win in postseason, builds it with the arms, not just three starters, but he, he recruits five starters that can go out there and throw. There's going to be pop in the order, and he's done a good job in the transfer portal so far and obviously done a good job in traditional recruiting. So um, won't chalk me at all if there's more return trips to Omaha. It's just it's so difficult every single year, it's kind of hard to answer that question. Uh, we'll go to DMV Vol 1985. Who were the biggest com uh, competition for Mike Matthews? What are his top three de three decision priorities, if you know those, and rank his top contenders in each? Say that again. All right. Biggest competition for Mike Matthews, his top three decision priorities, and if you can, kind of rank those in terms of which team best fits those. Um. You know, I continue to think right now here at the start of the July for Mike Matthews that it's Tennessee USC. Um, Clemson's hanging around. Um, there's some optimism there. They feel like they laid some really good groundwork in the month of June with that first official visit weekend. Um, he's been to Clemson a lot, so there's a lot of familiar familiarity there. Um, he likes the culture at Clemson. So for me, let, let's go to the second part of this question. Um, culture is very, very important to Mike Matthews. I anytime that I've talked to him, that's one thing that consistently comes up. Um, culture is very important. I I'd probably put it around number one. Um, scheme, you know, how how is he going to get the football? Um, yeah, what kind of touches is he going to get? Is number two? I think you could interchange those. And, and then number three, I think he's very interested in the quarterback play. Um, around each program and who's going to be facilitating him the ball in the future. Um, he's mentioned that multiple times. Um, he hasn't always had the best quarterback play at the high school level. Um, now, he's seen good quarterback play. He's He plays on you know, one of the best seven-on-seven seven teams every year annually, so he understands the value of that. He's played with other really good players, um, you know, so he understands how, you know, important that type of thing is. And to me, I think – you know, a lot of those things line up in Tennessee's favor. Um, I think the Vols really made a move there in January with the culture. Um, the family really enjoyed the visit. Um, I think from what he sees in Tennessee's offense, I think he sees himself being able to fit in. Um, and then I think at the end of the day, he's very intrigued by the prospect of Jake Merklinger and, and Nico Iamaliava being here at the quarterback position. Now, again, on the other side of things, you know, you don't hear much talk out here about the culture at USC, but Mike holds USC in high regards. They have really good quarterback play. You know, Lincoln Riley has always had good quarterback play, and it's it's a good scheme. To me, it, are they able to overcome the distance in that one? Um, you know, and then I think if Clemson wins out in some form, a lot of that just has to do with the culture, and, you know, we'll see what happens. But I to me, it's Tennessee, USC, and those are the things that he's focused on. All right, we'll shift gears here to Nashville 615. A good question for for Rob and, and Brent because they've been around it longer than you and I, Matt. But uh, the recruiting calendar, if you could propose a rule change, maybe what would that be, Rob? And you know, he, he says the poster, you know, moving National Signing Day back to February would be what he would do. If I could change the recruiting calendar in football, it would be an early signing day that, that is meaningful, like before Labor Day like the, the weekend before Labor Day. And, uh, you know, 10 years ago, that would have seemed outlandish, but not anymore. Not when, not at the rate we just, what do we see Tennessee have in, in June? 30 official visitors, mm -hmm. which, you know, was not uncommon. I mean, for, for a school. And, um, you know, and I'll also say that because so many kids are enrolling early and it's, if you had the, had an early signing period for football, say, you know, last week of August before, you know, the fo football season started that's when you when you're talking about kids graduating high school in december and rolling in january it, it's really no different at all than the early signing period in, in basketball when, when kids sign in november of their senior year and you know enroll in, in most cases in, in summer school you know the memorial day weekend so to me that's that, that's that would be my big big change for football early signing an early signing day that that meant something in, instead of one that was six weeks in front of where it's always been. Yeah, I agree. I think the December date is, is pointless. Um, you know, if you're going to continue to have all of these official visits in May and June and kids are going to be making all these decisions in July. Um, you know, if you're, 
if you're trying to fix the calendar for coaches and um, all of those types of things, then eliminate summertime, spring and summertime official visits and go back to the old calendar way, which I don't think is going to happen in large part uh, because of, of the midterm enrollees. Uh, but to, to visit in, in June and then not sign until December – when everybody's making a commitment in in July, um, you know, go ahead and go ahead and let them go ahead and let them sign in August and and go and, and, and move forward. I mean, with the one time transfer portal, the whole notion of well, they don't they can't sign that early because if there's a coaching change or whatever, I mean, they'll be able to get out of that. A school can release them or they can transfer after a year if it doesn't work out for them that way. Um, so, you know, I, I think you go one of two ways. If you're going to go back to the old February date. Let's let's change dramatically change the summer calendar and go back to the old summer calendar. Uh, if you're going to go with official visits in, in the spring and the summer, uh, then I think you need to sign earlier because I, I just I don't see the point in, in waiting five months to sign af after you've taken all your visits. Um, but I don't think anything's changing anytime soon. Yeah, I don't. And on the other in, in basketball, and I don't have an answer for basketball, but that calendar with the transfer portal and the kids to clean for the draft and having to get work out, get, you know, workouts and get information. That's a disaster for college coaches right now who, you know, yet. And, and this is pounded home for me from just spending some time with Josiah, you know, this month um, that, you know, I mean, coaches have no option, but to go and, and dive feet, you know, with both feet into the transfer portal. But at the same time, I mean, you've got, dozens and dozens of kids that were like Josiah who didn't know if they were leaving, didn't know if they're coming back, but coaches can't hold that scholarship for them, you know, in, in April when, you know, when it, when it's, you know, transfer mania and, you know, the NBA draft's not going to move. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of that. So I, I don't know that there's an answer. I, I don't think there probably is a, a really good answer, but just to, just to shine a spotlight on it, that, that April, early May, you know, window for college basketball coaches is brutal. You know, Rob, Rob, and I know we're, we got to get to the next question here. Do you think that the to help alleviate that, is there any chance the NBA and college basketball would get to a point where they went back to the old school way, where you could not pull yourself out of the draft once you declared that once you, if you declared in April at the end of the basketball season, you were in the draft, you were in the draft, you know, because then at least you know no kids trying to come back on you. Do you think they would ever do that, or do you think they'll always leave that open where a yeah, guy can I, declare and I, still pull himself out? I think they'll always leave it open. The NBA will. And it'll be up to the NCAA, you know, to, to change it. The NBA, in my opinion, doesn't care. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I, it's not – they just look at it as not, not my problem. Yeah, agreed. Makes sense. Now we got plenty more questions to get into, but first, let's get a word from our proud sponsors, Exterior Home Solutions. Your roof, it's the most important protection against nature for your home – or your business. That's why I trust the experts at Exterior Home Solutions. All right, we got plenty more to get into. Let's go ahead and go to um, let's go to Nashville six one five. Another question from him: Top three most important recruits in the twenty twenty four class. Matt, are they currently committed, still out there, or a little mixture of both? Um, I think they're. That's a good question. I think Jake Merklinger is very important. Um, obviously, anytime you can get a quarterback of his caliber um, with what you already had before, uh, you know, you can't overlook that. Um, you know, I think that's very important that he's in the class and got in when he did. He's been a big-time peer recruiter. Um, you know, right now, Jonathan Eccles, I think, is as important as any recruit in the class. You know, the fact that he shut his recruitment down in Tennessee's got – a really good athlete at the tight end position with, you know, those traits that they covet. Um, I, I mean, I think offensive tackle, I mean, that guy's still out there. You're, you're going after Bennett Warren. You're going to swing at Brandon Baker. But Tennessee has to have something there. Um, so, I mean, that, ta that, that position is probably as, you know, as important as any in this class, I would say right now. So, I mean, that one seems to definitely still be out there. Gage Ginther can play some tackle in a pinch. Max Anderson could play some tackle in a pinch. But, you know, right now you're you're still swinging at your at your tackle body. Um, and then, you know, on the defensive side of the ball, you, you need a you need a disruptor um, that, that can slot into the middle of that defensive line. And I think that's still out there as well. So, for me, that, that would be the, the most important right now. 
All right, let's go to Z Vols. A couple questions here. Brent, I'm going to let you take the first one. Do you think the baseballs program is on its way to being financially self sufficient or possibly even profitable? No. No, I, I don't think so. When you factor in scholarship costs, travel costs, so much travel um, in those sports, you know, co- you know, coaching, you know, coaching salaries versus what you make at the gate. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't see. I don't see them being profitable. Hypothetically, if Billy Amick, uh, Ryan Galaney, and Zane Ditton are all on the roster next year, where does everybody move to? Is Burke a DH? Is Moore in left field? Ditton to left field? Can Amick or Moore play shortstop? Yeah, it's a big old hypothetical. Uh, that would be pretty much every single thing falling Tennessee's way, and it could happen. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, we'll see. But that's a good problem to have um, if you're Tony Vitello and Josh Elander and that that coaching staff. Um, you know, Amick has options, can play the corner infield. Can, I think he can you know, play a little minute middle infield if needed. Galaney, the same ways, corner infield, he can play outfield as well. Uh, you know, Denton, we'll see. He's a third baseman. You know, can he play second base? I don't know. You know, we'll, we'll you know, I'm sure that he could po- possibly get some look there to, in, in the fall if he were to return. Um, Moore can play outfield. Moore's playing outfield right now for Team USA. A little bit. Burke can simply D- Burke can definitely DH, and all these guys can DH. So, um, if all those pieces were to fall in, you know, they would find a way to make it work. But that is a great problem to have because it means you you pretty much did everything you needed to get done in the off season, and you've you, you've got good bats anywhere you want to put them. So, a good problem to have for sure. Let's go to Ryan, 46 Orange. What's going on with Andre Carrick? Uh, Did he expect to walk into a starting spot? Is he working as hard as Ollie Lane this summer? What do we see happening at left guard, Brent? Well, I mean, I think Andre's learning the system. Um, I don't think he walked in expecting to be handed the starting job. I think he felt like his opportunity to play here uh, was on him. He felt like the opportunity was better here than it was at Texas, which is why he chose to leave. Um, but I don't think he was I, – I don't think he felt like he was anointed anything by picking Tennessee in the transfer portal. Um, in terms of working hard, I mean, na- naming the last guy who hasn't worked hard in the summer. You know, I mean, I, I don't – I'm not over there every day, but I, I don't think any of those guys are taking the summer off. So, should be a good competition. I think you throw Addison Nichols into that converse, conversation as well at the guard spot, and, and I think the left guard spot you know, position is certainly up for grabs. I, at this point, I would think Ollie Lane holds the the inside position going into fall camp because he's got experience there. Um, he's played there. Addison Nichols hasn't played, you know, very much at all. Um, Kirk's never played in this system. So uh, can Ollie Lane hold it off for a month and, and be the starter going into the Virginia game? I don't know. That That's, you know, that's going to be one of the good competition, one of the good position battles that takes place this fall camp. Can I have three pegs here, right? If you want to look at it this way, Ollie Lane's a guard. He's played in this offense. He's played a lot. Uh, you got Addison Nichols, who is a guard, who's practicing this offense at guard, and he's practiced a lot, but he hadn't played. And then you have Andre Carrick, who is just brand new to this offense, right? I mean, he's a guard, but it's brand new. So uh, I'm with you. I'm that's that's probably one of my favorite storylines this fall camp is that left guard spot. Uh, let's go to Nashville ninety four. Rob, what are realistic expectations for this football team this upcoming year? I mean, I think 10 games is super realistic. And, you know, if you pull an upset at home over Georgia or, you know, if Alabama's quarterback play is spotty and you can go down, go to Tuscaloosa and score, score some points, I mean, you could pull an upset there. But I, I think 10 games is super realistic. And, I mean, it, if you fall short of that, it would be a huge disappointment. I mean, you could certainly stub your toe somewhere. It's not like Tennessee's dominant. But I, I would – if I'm a fan, and I think I think ten games is a, is a very realistic, very attainable goal, and, and would be a great season. All right, let's go around the room for this first one. HS Vol, uh, does Caleb Herring get over four sacks? Matt, uh, well, what number was James Pierce at last year? James Pierce wrong... probably like two, two and a half, but I it was involved. Caleb yeah. Herring both got get two, didn't they? I mean, I think I think that's the number that I see. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, mean I, that's kind of the role I, I think that's the role I kind of see Caleb Herring in this year. Some situational football. Um, I'm going to go under. But but Matt, at the same, I mean, he could play the whole second half against Austin P and get oh, absolutely you know, two sacks. Yeah, I mean, that's, absolutely. That's, that's what could skew it. I, yep. I mean, 
Yeah, I would go take, under I, as well, but I think that, you know, obviously you'll see a – I mean, Joshua Joseph played a ton of snaps last year as a true freshman, but, you know, the, the sacks weren't up there, but he was getting a whole lot of playing time. So I think it's just kind of depending on what it is. Uh, second part of the question, if the balls land, uh, Bennett Warren, Warren and William Satterwhite, what grade would you put to the offensive line class? Uh, good question. Um, solid – B. I mean, to a B plus, I guess. I'm just not good at grading those things out. It's a really good class, I think, if you have... You're better at percentages, right? Yeah, well, I was really wanting earlier, after you kind of listed everything out there that that could happen, I wanted you to list a percentage in terms of roster number of who was going to be the opening day roster there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think overall that's a really good class. And, And when you look at it, you have Max Anderson, a guy that was coveted by... Oklahoma, Michigan, and others. You would have Bennett Warren if you're able to land him, a guy that was coveted by Texas A&M, Michigan, you know, Oregon. Uh, you would have Satter White, who was coveted by Penn State and Clemson. So I think that's a really good class overall. And then Gage Ginther, who I think, again, is as good as anybody in this class, you know, in terms of, of his ceiling and where he could go. River Rat Vol wants to know what intrigued you to do this for a living and what still excites you about this today. Uh, Brent, let's start with you. Um, you know, my, my attraction to it was, was trying to get news, trying to know something before somebody else. Um, I kind of caught that bug. Um, there's a question in the podcast that somebody was asking is, is the host of volunteers podcast going to come back uh, at some point that Barry Rice was putting together. And I don't know, Barry just retired. Um, I'm not going to spend 20 minutes telling Barry Rice stories, but interestingly, I interviewed with Barry Rice to be a film guy because when I went to college, I wanted to be a video guy. And um, I decided not to take the job. He offered me the job. I decided not to take it. It paid minimum wage and you had to cover, you had to go film football practice every day, Uh, set up in the tower and, and be one of those film guys. And I thought it was just preposterous that you would want to go to football practice every day and 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 watch football practice every day and, and shoot practice video every day. Made no sense to me. Then I take an internship in radio and I get a full time job covering football practice every day. But um, I got bit by the bug to 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 try to know something before somebody else knew it, um, and and that's kind of what got me started. What about you, Rob? Well. I initially I went to a VolQuest.com interview just as a front to get Brent Hubbs' autograph and then <laughs> ended up offered got offered the job and, and, and took it and I'm still here. <laughs> Rob Lewis, Rob Lewis got to get a job at VolQuest because he knew more basketball recruiting information in about a five minute span uh, in a in a hotel uh, banquet room on Straw Plains Pike that I ever dreamed of imagining. He knew all these people in basketball recruiting, and it was like, hire this guy. Because I didn't know the first thing about basketball recruiting. I had covered football recruiting extensively, but I didn't know the summer camp scene and basketball as well. And and Rob had a bunch of ties to the Gibbons camp in North Carolina, which was a, a big-time camp back in the day, and um, all of those types of things. And, and that's uh, – that was a huge. That was a huge factor because I knew he would be a nice. Uh, he would be a nice addition to handle some basketball stuff that I had no clue about. Matt, you've not been covering recruiting an awfully long time. How would you get into it? Uh, probably about five, five, six years now. Maybe I don't know. Um, you know, after after I finished some things up, different degree wise, and and got into the real world, had the opportunity to you know try to get back around the game of football. Um, I played it my whole life growing up, and obviously wasn't you know good enough to play it at the next level or anything like that. So, had an opportunity to get back around it, and um, you know that the, the best way to do that was covering recruiting. It felt like um, so got into that and kind of got the bug for it. Like, hey, this is. Yeah, there's days where I'd say fun, but it's always something going. You could always be doing something in the recruiting world and, you know, just, just kept working at it and, you know, got lucky enough to be here. Well, I love sports and I love to write. And um, I wanted to be, I, I mean, obviously I wanted to be in radio. That's, that's what I wanted to do, just like Brent. And I was super broke not making no money and Austin Frost was like, Hey, why don't you write some recruiting articles for a couple times a week? And I was like, heck yeah. So I did that and started kind of growing that a little bit. And, 
you can tell I do a little bit of everything here, but um, kind of like what you said, Matt, I just love sports, love, love to hang around it. And obviously, you know, if you have a couple of, couple of things you can bring to the table, like writing and reporting, then that helps. And so that's kind of, kind of how I came into this whole thing. This is, this is probably cliche. I hope Austin sees us on his cruise in Alaska, but I might have hung it up at a certain point trying to do this on my own if it wouldn't have been for Austin Price. That guy, he kept, he kept me up at night. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, beating my head against the wall, like keeping me up at night. It's all. I mean, I thought I had him scooped one time. I was so, I was so excited. Flew all the way to Florida, do a commitment story with a kid. Kid had promised me it was exclusive, and it and the kid stayed exclusive. And then the day before, Austin got me on one. Like, you know, like, it, it was just those things. It was like, okay, you know, uh, he, he he really kept me going at, at a lot of different times. You flew to Florida on your own dime just for a commitment story? Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Kid didn't end up in the class either. <laughs> well, of course. That's how it always works. But good for you. <laughs> he committed, um, which, I mean – Afterwards, he talked to everybody, which was fine. You know, you, you do it ever how you want. But he promised me, he's like, if, if you're coming, to, which I was in Florida for something different as well. I mean, okay. I, I saw him as well, but he was the driving factor. But I was able to to go around and, and make a little bit more of a trip out of it. But uh, Austin got Elijah Herring the day before me, and I didn't get him. <laughs> so, well, I can almost guarantee you Austin's not going to watch this on his cruise, so your, your secret's probably safe here. No, nah, I'll, uh, I'll clip it and send it to him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a couple more here. Let's go to Wrong Handed. Y'all seem to uh, have mentioned that Boo is a really strong peer recruiter and has that influence. With that in mind, who were some other of the best peer recruiters that you can remember while covering Tennessee? Brent? Well, it starts for me with Peyton Manning because nobody even knew what peer recruiting was. It didn't feel like it until Peyton came aboard. And, and Peyton went to work after he committed um, and, and called Marcus Nash and a bunch of those receivers and, and recruited those guys uh, to, to come play for, come play in the class with him. So uh, he, was a, he was a big peer recruiter. Um, Rob, that, that group of – and I don't remember who was the lead dog, but you had Chris Walker, Chris Donald, um, Ben, um, Ben Martin, Ben Martin. Those, that was, those were Perry. different years. Were they ben, all different years? Well, not, not all of them, but I just, I just know from being in San Antonio for the U S army game, which used to be such a hill, huge deal. Ben Martin was, I think a year, one year removed from Chris Donald. They were, it was, they were different years, but those, there, there was, there was one of those classes there that Eric Berry was involved in and a, and a bunch of them committed in privately in September um and they were kind of they kind of all recruited each other and was a big part of that i I don't remember exactly who was in it but those guys had a big influence um with each other because they'd been around you know each other a a lot um peer recruiting is different now to me though because god i mean man all these guys take a hundred trips you know i mean it's one of those deals where Hey, I saw you at Clemson last week. Hey, I'll see you at Alabama next week. Or, the, hey, I saw, I saw you in two weeks. the seven on seven tournament. In, you yeah, know, yeah, in, in that's Atlanta. that's the thing. Everybody knows everybody from the seven on seven tournaments. So. Like, yeah, it's, it's just yeah, it's a different world now with peer recruiting and you know social media as well. Um, yeah. You know, you're you're active on there, but you, you just do what you can do. All right, let's finish off with this one. This is from Volunteer at 87. Uh, He said this might be an incorrect observation, uh, but it feels like defensive tackles for the last couple of cycles have been uh, NIL-driven recruitments, you know, maybe as much, maybe as much as some other positions, but obviously not as much as quarterbacks. Is that an uninformed rumor, or do you think there's some legs to that and the thought of the defensive tackle position really values uh, their skill set at the next level? What do you think about Defensive tackle and name, image, and likeness in terms of recruiting today, Matt? Um, you know, I think anything with name, image, and likeness, I think we've touched on this before, but I, I think it's, uh, you know, similar. I mean, again, it depends. There's exceptions to this rule, and there's exceptions to this in the NFL, too. But I think the guys you see getting paid in the NFL are, you know, the guys you see getting paid in, in college football. Um, you know, and if you're a havoc wreaking defensive tackle, you're – your payday's coming at some point. Uh, you know, just as simple as just the same as if you're an edge that can bend and you're going to get, you know, 10, 12, 15 sacks a year, you're you're going to get paid. Um, the quarterback position is going to get paid. And, 
you know, that's just how it is. That's kind of where I'm at on it. Um, you know, I don't think every recruitment's driven that way, but I think for the big time guys, they're they're going to have their opportunity to make some money, be a name, image, and likeness at some point. And I think this is the challenge for college athletes or high school athletes, um, and and early in their career, college athletes to understand that 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 there is going to ultimately end up being a pecking order, right? Yep. Much like the NFL, that the guy the guys who can get to the quarterback, Rob Lewis, are going to make the most money on defense. The guys who can protect the quarterback on offense are going to make the most are going to make the most money of anybody on the offensive line. Those edge guys, are, the tackles are going to make more money than the guards. The quarterback's going to make the most money. You, you know, I, I mean, I, I just I think that's a threshold that will have to get crossed as this thing continues to go. I think it's a hard threshold for a seventeen year old to understand. You know that that. Hey, I'm as good as th- I'm, I'm getting recruited by the same schools as this guy. How come I don't have the same opportunities that, that this guy has? Well, it's the position that you play. And that's just something that, that is going to have to become entrenched, you know, for, for those young guys to understand that, that I think is going to be a challenge. Yeah. I mean, obviously we'll, we'll never see the breakdown and you know, nobody will from any of the collectives, but I, I bet you as this thing settles down and, you know, everybody gets a feel for, you know, what the market is. I, I bet that those collective payrolls will look a lot like NFL, you know, salary spreads. We, we, just like you just like you were talking about, Hubber, you know, quarterbacks, receivers, edge guys, cornerbacks, and, and defensive tackles. I, I think you're pretty high up there. Yeah. And, I, and, they'll, and Matt talked about this earlier in this podcast. He's exactly right. There's always, there will always be some exceptions out there much the same way some NFL team overpays in free agency because they are void at a position. They need a veteran to come in and play right then, whether it's center, whether it's linebacker or safety, whatever, and they will pay more than other teams will pay in free agency. You're going to see that particularly in the transfer portal with some kids who are going to get paid a lot because school X that they go to is in dire need of a starter. They need a plug and play guy. And because of that, they may be willing to do more NIL. They meant the collective, they may be able to do more NIL stuff with them because the need is so great there. You're always going to have an exception or two out there like that, in my opinion. And then just for fun, I said last one, but I just saw this one. For fun, AP threw in there. So I guess he's not, you know, vacationing too hard. Star bench cut, JG, Crompton, or Peterman. I think it's pretty easy if you you can kind of make it your own, but if you get the Kiffin version of Crompton, yeah. he's the start no matter what. And I, I would start Crompton. I would and then you can look at Peterman. Hell, he's I think he's still in the NFL, uh, isn't he? Yeah, I know he was bad he here. Would, he's an immediate cut for me without even thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean That's fair. I mean, a great kid, and I, you know, enough. The statute of limitations has got to be passed. Being critical of a, of a college kid, but that first quarter in Gainesville is the most abysmal thing I've ever seen. From, Didn't he have a, a broken Tennessee. thumb or something? I, I, he, a Tennessee fan base had a broken spirit after after those first three <laughs> series. I can promise you that. Yeah, the fact that they just up and started him at that game is the most Out of bizarre. Nowhere. Just the most, but put that kid in such a such an unfair. Just put him in such an unfair spot. Now, I, I'm, I think in this offense, w- with with some reduced battle scars and not getting beat up all the time, I, I think JG could be a much better player than, than what we saw in his career at Tennessee. Uh, but you know, give me Jonathan Crompton. I think Jonathan Crompton would have would have thrived in this offense. I really thousand and nine Crompton for sure. You know, I, I think that. I think this offense would have been really good for Jonathan Crompton, and he would have been he would have been productive in, in this offense. All right, that's going to do it here for you this edition really, of the Vol- You just really ask an AP mailbag question. I did. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Unbelievable. And he got some traction. People were chiming in in the thread, so I yeah. thought we'd give give us our okay. take on that. That was go. funny. All right, I got you. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, presented each and every week by Exterior Home Solutions. If you have any need, any repairs for your home, maintenance, whatever the case may be, give, give them a call today. You can give a free estimate with that call. It's at 865-524-5888, or you can visit them online, exteriorhomesolutions.com. Uh, for Matt Ray, Rob Lewis, Brent Hubbs, I'm Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys, as always, for tuning in to the Ball Quest Mailbag Podcast. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody. 